master that was stitching, we changed the protocol we're using to communicate with Blender. And Blender itself required a lot, a lot of tests and eventual fix. But I think that's, that's how it is. Uh, this is an example of my communication with Barney Broomer. I think the client, but the coworker. So he was saying it is over. This is a sample of how the, the light table was lit up from the input. So he was like sending over so I could test if the blender was reading the data properly. And if it wasn't, uh, we had a problem. Houston, we had a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Two months before the project. So in July, I was actually on vacation. And they received the project was has been postponed after July to January. And then in July, August, I was on vacation, I received an email saying that the university decided to brought forward the project to the end of September, like two months from that email. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, I say I have one year deadline, but that's, we are always waiting for the definition for the program. We wanted to have it, the art contest, we wanted everything. We always want everything. And we had to forget about art contest because truly said, that was a huge unknown. It's really, I would love to try this idea, see if people would tag along, but you couldn't take the luxury of the risk. And then, of course, I had to move from developer to artist, try some concepts. This is uh, one of the first samples I read in the Blender 2.5. The samples I was sending to the client. It's interesting because, of course, the canvas is a bidimensional canvas, right? We are projecting with a regular projector. But the whole creation was of a 3D model that once you capture from the Blender DOM camera, is like a fish eye camera. We actually would project that flat, but we wanted to bring the idea, the illusion of depth, a little bit of 3D, 3Dness to this 2D canvas. So that's the very rough idea of the kind of workflow we wanted the code to support. And then on top of that, we could create the art. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, can you go back one? Oh, oh, that's it. And then one month before. So finally, I set a deal with the university that I couldn't work alone. It wouldn't be fun. And then I had Mike Penn, I had Martin Schiopetis coming over. Well. We have been working together for a few projects offline and online. Martin is only online. It was really, really nice to take a project like this like, as a chance to bring together people you know through the Blender community. It's quite exciting. And the second is from Ms. Van der Rohe. Less is more. Uh, we basically forgot about all the ideas of multiple visualizations and multiple ways to and right and wrong way. If we, want, we would like to focus on one single, very nice, polished visualization and had one year to accomplish that, one month to accomplish that. This uh, is still the, one of the rough concept ideas. We're working on this, that idea of a platform. We're gonna get more into the concept layer. Looks like a spaceship or something. Um, and then 10 days before the project. So at some point, working online it doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, it works for some of, the, some of the tasks, but if you need to work in a rush and very synced with the rest of the team, First, you need to be able to, do, to work 12 hours in the project, things that off, uh, online sometimes you can't. You need to be able to communicate quickly and to assign tasks and not necessarily have to go over and, well, and, and control them yourself. So basically, we needed to go there and, and work on Locus. Uh, it was the time to forget about creation, creativity, and take whatever we had and work on top of that. So we are at the same time working as directing, producing, creating. And in terms of coding, we, we, we couldn't have the luxury of new, new feature, so we basically had to go and optimize what we had. Uh, so we float, we flew. Uh, some images. Uh, then this is example testing. So we know your Frankie was uh, hardware consuming. This is a Blender Foundation open game. So this is your already testing some of the, the machines you had over there. Quite powerful machine. And of course, we had the, the <laughs> we were lucky enough to be working the same week as Intel was released. So we actually attended the premiere. And this, -da -da, this example, this techno discussion. So the game, the Blender game engine has 
this has different people that use it, but a lot of the users are what you call techno artists. So they're always talking about art, but always talking about math, shading, language. So this is a classic example of where try to sketch, sketch some formulas together. And then the event. So the event itself was three nights. This is, is the third night. And uh, this is one of the, we have a computer that was as good as the one we are actually using for the visualization. Um, we actually have, we're using two, uh, one ATI that actually allows you for horizontal expanding. So actually we're exporting as a 4K by 1K. We're gonna get to that later. And yeah, and now we're gonna, so this is actually in a container. We are working for 10 days in a small container. It was fun and during the event it was actually where the first ad support was being hosted as well. And then this is inside the dome. So we actually have a place in one, one of the corners, so the VJ booth. No one, the DJ booth is in the middle. The VJ booth is, and this is running the visualization. So what do we have here? No, let back there. <laughs> so we have some, some events that are always happening, such as the wave is always waving. We have this plan on the top, always going over. And then we have one line. It's like we are seeing the platform whenever we actually have one particle falling. So there's real data in real time. Uh, we actually have a threshold. It's real data, but we're actually filtering a little bit. But it's pretty much real time. We're running at 40 FPS, but the stitching hardware was 30 FPS. So it's, and what else we have here? So as you can see here, work in real time also the, the light sticks from the, the light table. And there is, well, they were calling officially our work VJing, so visual jockey as the DJ, but working with visuals. So we actually could control a lot of things. One of the things was the, for example, the wave, the whole thing, the whole environment color. You could change things such as hue, saturation, gamma. You could play back the color or not. We're playing the hue. Um, we could change, we could actually, we could manually add more particles. We're gonna show the file, of course. Because we can't fake data, but whenever we see a particle coming, we can keep hitting the key to keep the, to make it more impressive. It's still not fake, we are working on top of real data. <coughs> and, sorry? So, in order to get there, we actually had to work in two different fronts at the same time. Um, during these 10 days, at some point I was working only the code, while Martrish and Mike were working on the art. Uh, when you talk about coding, at that point we're talking about optimization. And we are initially, oh okay, I'll get to the optimization part. But here first, just some previously at Blender Conference 2009. Uh, last year, I presented a work exactly on the full DOM, well, on the fish eye rendering mode for the Blender Game Engine. And this work is, was built on top of that. Since that time, I had some features I wanted to implement and some functions that I knew I could uh, optimize. But basically, uh, when you're talking about fish eye mold into a Blender game engine, we are talking about a cube map. So I have one camera taking different images from the environment every frame. We put them together as a cube, and then we make them work as a same sphere or a sphere or whatever shape you want. You can. Just so the first challenge, how can you have four, three, whatever, multiple number of frames of renders every frame and still make sure you can run at 6 FPS, ex outputting a 4K by 1K? Of course, that's, that was our ideal. And then we didn't manage to get 60, but we got it 40. And initially, after initial code, we had uh, everything running at f uh, 20 FPS. It was really, really bad. And we are really concerned, so the art department, that we, ha we need to load down into the effects, the particles. But we didn't, we actually didn't give up. So actually, yeah, until like the 30 minutes before the first night, we managed to solve one of the problems. So we got from 20 to 40 FPS. It was quite, quite, <laughs> was worthy. But it was hard because three, four days without sleeping, thinking through math is crazy. 
when you talk about optimization here, of course, we want no compromise. Everyone wants no compromise. Um, basically, make it, make it long short. What you want is to make sure we render only what we need. Well, we are talking about, you saw in the pictures, that the dome is not being used completely. For example, we are not projecting in the top. Uh, we are not projecting even the horizont. So you, if you can render only, not the whole cube map, but only part of that, and this cube, the geometry, is also corresponding to that, we have some gain. But that's not the big thing. The big thing is the Blender rasterizer code is quite linear when you're talk, you talking about making it run one, two, three times. So if you have three cameras, you're going to have half the, tw twice the performance as if you have six cameras. If you have so one camera, two cameras, keep multiplying, three, four, five, six. Initially, we were running four cameras to get the fish eye mode. And so our first goal was to try to make from four to three that we managed. But in order to do that, and in order to get 4K by, 4K wasn't a problem, but to get the, all the, the definition for the vertical, we had to use FBO, something more technical, but it's a way to render, ignoring the buff, visual buffer, but render straight on image. And also the off X first tone. That's a thing a lot of people don't use, but nowadays it's, it's very used for this panora mega panoramics. So we do a lot of renders and stitch them together. But anyways, basically we had to go a little bit experimenting and try. So basically that's what you came up with. Uh, so we had actually three images only per scene. And <clears throat> it was actually tricky because for this field of, because of this geometry, we are actually only using half of the, the render geometry. And we only find that out after it was done. So it was good, it was faster, but it's really not ideal. And at some point, I actually want to implement that. That's actually, we still can have three cameras. It's okay, more, more technical, but you can have more performance. And that's just for the records, not explaining. Okay, so um, while Dalai was working mostly with the code, uh, Martin and I were um, the, the basically the graphic team who was behind uh, most of the, I would say, uh, Blender work. So I like to think of ourselves as a mini sort of Blender Institute when we're making the game. So we had three people, uh, you know, sort of two artists and then one um, programmer who supports us. For, so um, this way you can completely focus on, you know, just what you're good at while um, just trusting the other team member that you know they'll deliver the thing you know on time. So um, the logic behind the the game is simple. Well, it's a real time application. So we're reading the sensor data um, through OSC through the, the socket connection into Blender, well with Python, and that's happening maybe 30, 60 times a second. Once we get the data, we do a bit of filtering. We, um, well, depending on how much data there, uh, there is, um, we sometimes discard data, but um, just to keep the performance up, because when sometimes when you have too much um, events, muons, uh, particles coming in, then um, the physics engine gets bogged down and everything slows down. So for real time, you don't want that, that to happen. So. Um, once we have the sensor data, it's really simple. Um, for every time we detect the sensor, uh, we detect a particle. The Blender game engine will uh, emit a, a predefined um, physical object into the Blender world, and that then goes through its course uh, through. Uh, well, with, within its lifetime, it has it runs through all the, the graphic effects, um, well, plays back the animation, and uh, collides with other objects. Now, because also it's interactive and we want to add some more visual uh, this, uh, interactivity into the, uh, this uh, simulation, we, we, uh, we also cheated by adding some keyboard controls. So with the keyboard controls, we can change, we can uh, manually add the muons, which we didn't quite do during the event because that would, uh, that would sort of uh, distract everyone if you have the muon that doesn't correspond with the, the music, for example, because the visual is supposed to be synced up with the music and the lights, which all use the same sensor data. So if the sensor, if you started adding more particles than there is, then we have a problem. But the keyboard is mainly also used for, um, as mentioned before, uh, 
well, adjusting the colors and some of the post-processing settings in the, in the game. So it just adds a bit more variety to the scene. So um, for the artwork, we started with the concept. Um, I really just uh, started, I, I, I really joined the team maybe two weeks before everything started happening. So um, the concept was developed um, at a pretty late stage. We had some ideas, but um, nothing was concrete. A lot of the mock-ups you see at the beginning was done maybe a month to two weeks before the, before the actual event. So the concept stage is, it's interesting because, well, because of the medium that you're projecting this image onto, it's very different than traditional um, animation or traditional games where you have a free camera and you can go anywhere. Um, this one, you're limited to a 2D, well, screen that's spherical. So um, in a lot of the cases, the cam and the, the, the dome is rendered from the middle of, uh, middle of the, the, the circle so that um, you don't have a 3D effect as you traditionally would by moving the camera around. The camera is locked in place. So uh, we have to come up with some ways to convey the idea that uh, you're in the middle of a 3D space. Uh, two of the well, methods that we came up with is one, we can use uh, depth cues to sort of show people um, where, the, the, where the object is in the world. Um, so things like we can use uh, lighting effects, we can use um, fog that sort of falls off as the distance gets uh, greater to the viewer. Another um, idea we had was to use um, a, what they call forced perspective onto the user, so, uh, onto the, uh, the viewer. So as the, so basically as, as you look at something, it, there's a single vanishing point down, a single vanishing point. And the vanishing point, as you see from the wall there, uh, gives you an idea of perspective, even if the image is painted onto a 2D surface. So using these two tricks, we decided to make a main sort of environment where the object sort of stretches really far into the distance and then comes back. This way you get sort of a, a convergence effect where you see a single point down at the very um, far end. So. Um, another problem is that muons being, you know, subatomic particles traveling at nearly the speed of light, it's, they're pretty hard to see. So um, what we came up with is we decided that we want to emulate that originally by uh, making the uh, particles themselves invisible. And as they pass through the atmosphere, and in this case, pass through the, the dome, it will light up the scenes, it will light up the environment around it but it's, um, the particle itself would not be visible. So uh, this is one of the earlier mock-ups that we did. Um, this is just an, uh, well, uh, what we call a platform. So it's just something there that as the particle passes, it would light up the thing as it goes down. So again, uh, some limitation of the dome system, a few of which we thought about beforehand, a few of which were, came as a bit of a surprise when we came to the, um, when we came, uh, when we started working on site. Uh, the first one, which is pretty limiting, is that the image uh, we're working with, the entire visuals, has to be dark. Because what happens in a dome is if you project something really light onto one side, all that brightness is going to get reflected onto the other side of the dome. So you get a really washed out image. The contrast um, significantly lowers. So in order to avoid that, we basically have to keep the entire image almost pure black. So we can only have really um, small highlight spots. And those tend not to get, uh, get washed away to uh, uh, wash away the image. Um, apart from the fact that we have to follow a pretty dark color palette, um, the scale is also very different because you're working with a gigantic, you know, 30 meter dome that wraps around your entire uh, vision, and you know, working on the artwork on a 13 inch laptop really is not the same thing. So although we knew that uh, ahead of time that you know some of the scales would be different. Um, the first time we saw our prototype on the dome, it's still very, very, um, well, different. It's, 
well, uh, everything everything was everything was a lot bigger than we thought. So we still had to scale everything down. Um, a lot a lot of the stuff, the small uh, small smaller effects, turned out to be almost one or four pixels large. So, and um, it's not a full dome. Uh, so we, uh, meaning that it only goes from well, it didn't it goes from maybe twenty degrees from the horizon to. Um, I don't know, 60, 70 degrees. So you, it doesn't cover the zenith and it doesn't cover the horizon. Um, they did this in order to um, well, have the whole system work with six projectors. If they wanted to, co to cover more of the dome, they would have needed a lot more projectors. So this is one of those trade-offs that you just have to deal with. Um, so giving all the limitations, the concept w that we sort of Inspired that sort that inspired us uh, a lot was the Tron legacy trailer. I think the trailer just came out when we started working on it, so it's probably one of the reasons why we got really excited. But um, in the movie, uh, in the trailer, you can, if you remember, there was a lot of dark, uh, a lot of dark background colors. Um, pretty much uh, everything was self-illuminated by just you know single lines and which outlines the its shape. But um, the entire palette is pretty dark. So we thought this is sort of the look that we want uh, to go for because it's um, dark, it's sort of high techy. You have, the, you have a, a, a pretty singular color palette, but at the same time, you can you know, shift the colors and then get um, some very dynamic looks. So do you want to talk about the production? Or? Sure. Talk too much already. Well, Again, I started this project alone, great plans, great ideas, and then when you come up together, we forget about all that and do whatever you have to do, really. So that's the fun part of the produ production time. Um, basically, as we call an iterative process, we are dealing now with the real object, the real media, medium. So once we project there, it's totally different. And we actually wanted, we simply had access to the dome in mon on the Monday, the project was on Thursday, so like three, four days before. Interactive because, again, we're talking about we had the art team, but well, working together, and they come up with can we push this number of uh, particles? Can't, can't we? And we go to the code, no, it's that's the bottleneck, let's try some other nice, fancy effects. And in that sense, I would say the, the university and the well, the, the, the Barney, the producer, they were really much happy with whatever you could come up with. That was actually quite nice and unique. They were giving us the the credit of the free creation. But between us was quite a lot of changes. Yeah, and then the nice thing that's Blender Game Engine is really fast and really handy for prototyping. So again, the whole production was actually done in the 10 days, actually, the real production, uh, while we are into the, the place. And we be able to produce, okay, that show off of numbers, doesn't mean a lot, but a thousand lines of Python, 500 lines of, of JLS code, we actually recycled a lot of things we had, which we offer us individually and together. We, are, we didn't have to work with audio, that was actually a good thing. We tried not to use logic bricks, because we hate logic bricks. But we had only a few assets, and that's the other thing we come up with. We had small, single effects that we could uh, put them up together. So it was very scalable in terms of performance, again. We could easily turn one of them off, or make one of them more, more numeric. Uh, yeah, and so let's show the file. No, I need to, <laughs> it's not that. Oh, yeah, okay. Come on. Oh, my. Got it. I'll talk about that. <coughs> so typically, uh, when the artists, when uh, me and Martin worked on the, um, the, this, the graphics aspect of this, uh, we tended to use uh, this view, which is the regular stri uh, straight up camera view uh, with just mouse look. So you can sort of look around. Um, because when we're using the dome view, while we can see the entire image, it's a very distorted view because it's um, compressed four times horizontally. So um, everything looks very, very squished. Uh, in this case, this is. 
so in this case, every time you see one of those balls, uh, flames coming down, that's the muon particles. Right now, obviously, we're faking the fact, so we assign all the number keys to, to be the um, 12 sensors that would emit the muons. So we have some, what's up with the sharpness? <laughs> so as you can see, we can uh, play around with uh, a lot of the just well 2D filter settings. Um, the effects are really, you know, uh, added individually. Just we so and how they fit together is really just a matter of you know tweaking the different settings so that they look like they belong together. Um, this one doesn't have some of the particle effect that. Yeah. So. Um, one of the things that we came up with is this, well, the rainbow thing, but um, this uh, wave, water wave effect at the bottom. Because um, it turns out what they do, uh, what they, well, one of the reasons how they, uh, one of the ways to detect these uh, muon particles is um, they have this uh, heavy liquid, and as the uh, particles enter the liquid, it will sort of form a bubble trail. So uh, we thought we wanted to sort of uh, uh, emulate that. So we added a water surface. And as the particles enter the water surface, you would see the um, see sort of a, a, a splash. And, and yeah, of, so of course, right now, because the camera, we can freely move the camera around. Um, so sometimes the effect doesn't quite work. So you see misalignment uh, here and there. Um, and if you can go out of the platform, can you do that? So people get an overview of the. So now you're looking at the entire platform from more of more or less the bottom looking up. Um, so you see we have a, a, a star field because you know at the well the event name is cosmic sensation and the where the part uh, where the muon particles sub particles came from are uh, outer space. So uh, we thought that fits the theme pretty well. And we have this star field, which is it just adds a bit more brightness to the scene when or some uh, beats. So uh, the idea is that the star field would go with the beat. Every time there's a beat, it will sort of flash a bit like that. So. We keep going with individual. So um, the first thing you saw was the platform, which was that blue, the blue transparent, uh, semi-transparent, uh, dark glass material that you saw at the beginning. Um, the platform is really they're, they're really uh, it's most of the time it's invisible unless you have a particle hitting it. So as a particle travels through, it will light up the platform, and you'll see the, a color on the platform. The, so it, like I said, it uses light attenuation. It's a pretty simple uh, shader on the platform. We, well, Martin built it up with uh, nodes. So you, would, as, as it travels past, it will sort of just have a, a very nice fall off from bright to dark. Yeah, the geometry, we started with something pretty complex, like you saw in the mock-up. But um, as time goes on, we started to simplify things. We wanted we wanted to make it more um, streamlined, so that the 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 highlights, as seen from the middle of the dome, looks nicer. So and as we were working, we, we were constantly tweaking different things. The original idea was also this platform would serve as a, a physics a collision. A, a mesh for the particles, so that as the particles go through, it would sort of follow this curve, and you will see uh, from 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 the audience point of view, you will see the um, particles go all the way out and sort of come back in towards you at the end. Um, we really had trouble getting that to work properly with the physics engine. Maybe it would be better that um, had we used another approach, uh, perhaps. But basically, what the light drawing here is the the path of the part supposed uh, of the supposed particles. Uh, the particles themselves um, went from being in the concept stage, being invisible, to something that's more visible, um, and we ended up spending quite a bit of effect on the particles themselves. Uh, one of the things that you might have noticed earlier is that. 
for the fireworks effect. So when the particles um, collide with each other, they they form, they just make a bunch of other particles. And uh, one way to sort of add some realism and just visual interestingness to the particles is we wanted to add a motion blur, or more or less a motion blur to uh, uh, draw out the trail of the particles. So um, the really easy way to accomplish this turns out to be that uh, you align the particles to where they are headed and then you simply stretch them along that axis, along the axis in which they're traveling. So this way, wherever they're, if they're going that, like this, it will sort of follow through itself and just stretch it, uh, stretch it out. Uh, we'll do a demo of that um, right after this, or now? <laughs> Old. So these are all um, well, pretty much square particles, but uh, with a bit of scripting, uh, script running on each particle, you see this sort of nice effect. 